Thank you very much. So for the first 15 minutes or so, we're going to talk a little bit about how the molecular mechanisms synchronize with the new drugs that you're hearing uh, being developed for this uh, disease. And then you'll see uh, Brad and uh, Peter will give you additional talks about initial treatment of relapse disease followed by a panel discussion. So we're talking about a lymphoma that is a B-cell lymphoma that represents about 6 to 7 percent of all lymphomas. So if you, if you think of lymphoma as the seventh most common cancer in the United States with about 75,000 cases per year, then you got 6 percent of these are going to be mantle cell. The neat thing about this disorder is two new drugs in the last year uh, have been approved by the FDA, lenalidomide and abrutinib. And one of the key questions that we're probably not going to talk much about today is, is the remains is the role of transplantation in the first complete remission in light of these new drugs. Now, if you're really interested in the molecular mechanisms, I'd like you to, to take that jot down this article, which really goes into much more depth than we can in 15 minutes. It's a very nice article, and I'll show you some slides uh, from that. So this is uh, I, the, the diagnosis is made on the overexpression of cyclin D1, and that's because the uh, CCND1 or BCL1 uh, gene here is transposed from chromosome 11 to chromosome 15. And that sets the cell cycle going. And th this is a very important translocation and it defines the disease and you need to prove this by fish or by cyclin D1 staining on tissues in order to get your patient on a trial or to call it uh, mantle cell lymphoma. And uh, this gene in the past has been called BCL1 or PRAD1. Now you'll mostly see it as CCND1 and it's the gene that encodes cyclin D1. And so when it goes to the immunoglobulin heavy chain on 14, it deregulates the cell cycle. And that's why KI67, I'll give you the answer to one of those questions, is an important marker because it relates to the proliferation of the cell. Now this translocation actually occurs early at a pre-B cell, before the B cell actually enters into this mantle zone which surrounds the germinal center. Now if the cell, as it comes in here, after it's got this translocation, if it does not go into the germinal center, if it stays outside in the mantle zone, typically it will be unmutated. So you know in CLL where you do this mutational analysis to see if it's germline or somatically mutated, same thing can happen in CLL. So if it stays unmutated, usually it's SOX11 positive, it's a classical mantle cell or very rarely turns into a blastoid mantle cell, which is about 3% of all mantle cells and those are particularly nasty. If, however, the cell enters the germinal center, it actually becomes mutated and behaves a little bit sometimes like CLL, where you'll see the patient with a lot of cells in their blood, a big spleen, and in those cases, they tend to have a little more indolent course. Actually, Dr. Martin here has described that group of patients and how sometimes they can be, be watched. Usually later on, they get other genetic abnormalities and they, uh, they progress and they need treatment. So that's kind of the basic biology of how these, uh, where they're coming off at in, in the B cell differentiation. Now this is another picture from that paper, and what it shows is the various signal pathways that are deregulated. And what I did is I put the key drugs we're going to briefly mention here today on that pathway. So you can see lenalidomide interferes with cytokine signaling. Idelisib is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, and this pathway PI3 kinase mTOR is very important after the cell gets turned on to proliferate all the time. Abrutinib is knocking out BTK. And then bortezomib is affecting the proteasome down here. So all these drugs fit nicely into the pathophysiology. Now, these cells are smart, right? So you can see a couple pathways here that are untouched. And I suppose eventually we're going to need to target those to get better control of this disease. So let's first talk about this PI3 kinase uh, mTOR pathway. This pathway is heavily activated in all of you now because you just got done eating. And you can see glucose and amino acids are pouring into your cell, triggering this pathway, which then leads to the cells, hopefully not your fat cells, but some cells uh, growing in your body. And that turns that pathway on. And in mantle cells, they're addicted to that pathway. They are very dependent on the mTOR pathway. So starting at the top of the pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway, there's uh, Dr. Call recently published an article on using the idealisib, which was a, a drug that was uh, just recently approved for CLL in September. It's an oral agent that also has activity. It's a PI3 kinase delta inhibitor. It's a pill. And in this publication, you can read about its results in 40 patients with mantle cell lymphoma. Now, this was a typical uh, phase one kind of two uh, protocol with 40 patients that were heavily treated. They were older people, median of four prior therapies. 43% were refractory, and the key here is the response rate was decent, 40%, very few CRs, but 
a decent response rate with a the uh, duration of response of about three months. So this drug attacking the top of the pathway does have activity uh, in that disease. And you can see by the waterfall plot that most of the patients did have some form of response. Not all of them hit the actual 50% uh, mark. Now, let's look a little more downstream from the PA3 kinase. Now, this work is actually older than idealisib. So people started targeting mTOR, specifically mTORC1, a lot earlier. And if you look at mantle cell lines that are in the laboratory, you can see that all the components of the TORC1 pathway are revved up. Phospho-MTOR itself, Phospho-S6, and 4-EBP1. And you can see over here this nice diagram of what mTOR kinase does. It actually phosphorylates S6, and it phosphorylates 4-EBP1. Now, here's where it gets complicated. When it phosphorylates 4-EBP1, it releases EIF4E into the cytoplasm, and that is very important at translation of CAP-dependent proteins, and CAP-dependent proteins are those like cyclin D1 down here. You see MYC down here, cyclin D1, all the important uh, cyclin-dependent kinases and things that are part of the cell cycle get turned on. So now, if you look down here and you see, well, what does Everolimus do? Everolimus and Tempsorolimus are the TORC1 inhibitors that are approved by the FDA for other cancers in the United States. They're not specifically approved for mantle cell. But if you apply them in vitro, what you see is that Everolimus, for example, is a very good inhibitor of Phospho-S6. So it does a great job inhibiting this limb of the TORC1 signaling pathway. However, if you look at uh, Phospho-4-EBP1, uh, you can see that it's not so hot there. It knocks it down a little bit, but not very much. This is a large cell line. So it leaves EIF4E part open. And that's why this drug works a little bit, but it doesn't work completely to shut down the pathway. So this has been tested in lymphoma, Everolimus, single agent, relapse mantle cell lymphoma. And you can see from this publication a couple years ago, there were 19 mantle cells there. The response rate was 32%. So it's about a 30% drug in relapse uh, disease. Now, however, if you add it to rituximab, if you add a TORC1 inhibitor to rituximab, things get better. 71 patient study in the NCCDG. Now we're up to 60% response rates with uh, now we're getting almost 20% complete response rate. So combining a TORC1 inhibitor with rituximab, you do even better. And lastly, this has been moved completely up front now in a recent publication in the Annals of Oncology, combining rituximab, temsorolimus, and cladribine for initial therapy in older folks who don't, uh, aren't going to get a transplant, and that's uh, very effective. So this, these TORC1 inhibitors have now been moved up front They've also been moved up front in, with RCHOP in the Alliance Group for Large Cell Lymphoma. So we'll soon be learning how they do when they're combined with upfront therapy. I can't really tell you yet how it's all going to work out, but they certainly have activity. They're well tolerated. They contribute to the uh, treatment of mantle cell lymphoma. Now, the story doesn't end there. You might say, well, that's just a TORC1 inhibitor. I've just shown you that the TORC2 limb is left untouched. AKT is not touched very well. So what happens if you take a dual TORC1 inhibitors? And this is kind of the next wave of the future here that you're going to be hearing about is drugs that knock out both TORC1 and TORC2. Now you see this drug OSI here does a very good job on 4-EBP1, where rapamycin, the TORC1 agent, does not. If you look at Phospho-S6, it, it goes down actually better with rapamycin than it does uh, with OSI. So this drug, which actually this company is not choosing to take forward, but is an example of the dual inhibitors, which are going forward by other companies, which you will see in mantle cell lymphoma, perhaps will have uh, better activity. So this drug not only is, uh, knocks down 4-EBP1, uh, uh, but it also is cytotoxic, whereas rapamycin is not cytotoxic. It's just myelosuppressive. This drug actually kills the cells, as you can see in the blue lines here, whereas the red line, the rapamycin, just simply is cytostatic. Now let's move a little farther down the pathway over here to the proteasome, to nf or b And so if you look at uh, uh, bortezomib, bortezomib has single agent activity also in the 30% range. So if you, if you have a quiz ever and you want to guess what the single agent activity is, if you hit 30%, you're going to be right most of the time for bortezomib, for linalidomide, and for uh, everolimus and temsorolimus. Now, this is a study where we actually moved the bortezomib now up front. This is very recent data published. You may not have seen it, where uh, Brad Call and the ECOG group took the hyper CVAD group and made it a little more easy and added bortezomib to it. And so this regimen here was hyper CVAD light, 
adding bortezomib days one and four, along with maintenance rituximab. And uh, he showed, I actually don't have time to go through all that. I thought maybe Brad was going to refer to that. But this shows a very nice response with very similar survivals in patients who either had a transplant or did not have a transplant. So that's another example of moving the drug uh, up front. Now, going back up from the bottom to the top, now here's our pathway. Here's CD19, the, the B cell receptor. Here's PI3 kinase. We've already talked about idelisib. We've talked about mTOR inhibition. Now, here's this little kinase here, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase, right next to PI3 kinase. And so companies have now targeted that with a drug called abrutinib. And, of course, this made a big hit last year when it was published in the New England Journal using this drug as a single agent for this relapsed or refractory mantle cell lymphoma. So this was the results of that study. This is the duration of response. The response rate was 60%, a little over 60% for this drug. So this drug has the best single agent activity of any of the ones I've talked to you about so far. Now, why would that happen? Why would targeting right next to PI3 kinase be better than a drug that targets PI3 kinase? I don't know. But for some reason, this this hit it pretty nice. And you can see the responses are decent. There's a little drop off here in the first eight months, but there's a lot of patients now out here over a year on a single pill that are still doing uh, well. Now, right away, you can start to see, though, this is not a curable treatment. So we need to start thinking ahead. How are we going to combine ideal or, uh, abrutinib with other drugs? This is targeting BTK. Our patients are still relapsing. Not many of them are getting out here too long. So this is going to be, I think, a very similar scenario to what you see in myeloma with revlimid, pomalidomide, thalidomide, Velcade, now pushing the survival out, but you're still ending up with a patient who's relapsed at the end that you're trying to find the next treatment. So patients are living longer, but they're not totally cured yet, and so we still see the curves uh, going down. Okay, lastly about lenalidomide. What does lenalidomide do? If you look at this article, you can see one of the things it does is it suppresses cytokines. And I want to just show you a little bit of data recently published about cytokine analysis in mantle cell lymphoma. There hasn't been a lot on this, but we looked at uh, 30 cytokines in patients with 88 patients with untreated mantle cell lymphoma. And what you can see here is the blood of these patients is loaded with cyb IL-2 receptor, IL-12, IP-10, and MIG. These are inflammatory cytokines, monocytes, and all the key pathways are, are being driven by the cytokines that are hitting at the top of the pathway and then signaling and causing the cell to grow. And these are also prognostic, and they're actually a couple of them are independent of the MIPI score and perhaps would add to the MIPI score. So you can see if you have a high cyble IL-2 receptor, you do worse than if you have a normal or low uh, amount. Now, I showed you in that little cartoon that IL-10 is very important and is inhibited by lenalidomide. You can see that IL-10, although it did not make it in the uh, total multivariate analysis here, it is predicts an inferior survival of the hazard rate of 2.2 in this, in this uh, study and does potentially have activity that could be inhibited by uh, lenalidomide. So lenalidomide also was approved last year based on this study. And this was a single agent study of lenalidomide, same thing, relapsed mantle cell lymphoma, except this was a little bit different than the abrutinib study in that the FDA required a cell gene to take patients who had failed bortezomib. So these are people who failed the next FDA-approved agent, bortezomib, which, by the way, just got full approval for relapsed mantle cell very recently. It had provisional approval. But this study had patients only that had failed or been previously treated with uh, uh, bortezomib. And as you can see, again, we're hitting at 32% re response rates. Now, what's a little unique about this drug as composed to Everolimus or any of the other ones I've shown you here, is although this, you might say, well, only 30% response rate. If you look at the patients who do respond, the uh, duration of response is actually about, uh, I have it here somewhere, the median duration of response is 18 months. And so now you're getting a very good long duration of response for the 32% uh, who do respond. Now, picking those people out at the beginning is somewhat uh, difficult and challenging. So this is what the landscape looks like, I think, today for new untreated for an, in a non-study situation. The first question you ask is, is my patient a transplant candidate or not? If they're a transplant candidate, you've still got your options of hypercevad, of RCHOP with alternating with platinum, RCHOP with ARC, the Nordic regimen, or bendamustine rituxan, or the hypercevad. And at the end, a transplant is in, for most patients, less than 65 years of age. If you're not a transplant eligible, Predominantly bendamustine rituximab rules, 
with either rituxan maintenance or radium therapy consolidation. If you relapse, then we bring in these new drugs, as I've just shown you uh, in the previous few slides. This is the current national study that many of you have open. This is an ECOG study. And you can see that it's all bendamustine driven with six cycles of bendamustine with one key investigational arm here adding Velcade to the BR, so it's BVR, and then the lenalidomide added to rituximab bringing in the R squared in the maintenance. So we're going to learn what the role of Velcade up front is and what the role of adding Revlimid to the rituximab uh, maintenance. So in summary, uh, the prognosis has improved nicely for mantle cell lymphoma. Some patients, I believe, are cured. Uh, hard to predict those at the beginning. Using the old drugs, we're using the old drugs better and are moving these new drugs up. Two new approvals. We got Idilisa, which also has activity, but uh, approved for CLL. I think CR is important. Uh, we didn't talk about MRD, but there's a number of new uh, minimal residual disease tests, flow cytometry, uh, DNA analysis of the blood that are important that may come into play that are being tested in that ECOG trial. And then, of course, moving all of these up front to give the patient a better chance of being cured uh, right from the beginning. Thank you very much.